for you in the next two hours is that mind control is a valid subject. We can prove uh, a good deal of its history and its postulates, and especially in this litigious climate when people argue that therapists and others are, are crazy for believing in things like mind control, it's my function to show that the subject has validation across several centuries and especially a rich history. Uh, in this century, what I want to do is to uh, use uh, slides to illustrate my talk. And so if we could lower the lights, you'd be able to see the slides better. Uh, and let me begin. Can we, uh, yeah. Great, let me see. All right. Uh, naturally, the history of mind control begins with the proverbial hole in the head. Uh, this is the uh, an illustration of um, a trephined skull, the first known uh, medical intervention for a mental illness. Uh, there are uh, many such skulls that have been recovered from civilizations throughout the world, suggesting that trephining, uh, which is, as you can tell, an early form of lobotomy, uh, was uh, well practiced by many ancient civilizations. The, the reason uh, why the proverbial hole in the head here is important to us is that this, this was a therapeutic procedure built upon a uh, medical philosophy, uh, and the philosophy is one of possession. It seems to me that, that in many ways, as I'll suggest to you, these notions have come back again in the 20th century, and so I thought it appropriate to start with them now. The possession idea uh, carried through uh, well to the Middle Ages, uh, when possession theories of mental illness were uh, prevalent and cures based on them were equally as prevalent and indeed necessary. This is a, an illustration of medieval moon madness uh, and some of the, uh, the, the dancing uh, episodes that went throughout the Middle Ages. <clears throat> the treatment of choice was exorcism, which you see an illustration of here. Uh, if you look all the way over on the left, the woman being held by a group of men, there's a, a devil coming out of, uh, out of her head. Uh, this was, of course, the early equivalent of multiple personality disorder. Uh, and the, the notion of possession theory, uh, the body being inhabited by other beings, uh, is uh, an important aspect of dissociation. Uh, the theory may have changed somewhat, but there is certainly a direct history uh, from the possession ideas to the dissociation ideas that we experience today. The first, the, the, the first real treatise, I think, in mind control, uh, which brought together possession ideas uh, into a textbook, uh, is um, the Malleus Maleficarum which is uh, a, written in 1484. It's called The Witch's Hammer. Uh, and I was interested to note that in the latest issue of, I think, Newsweek magazine, with the, the cover story on the brain, uh, there is a one-page description of the Malleus Maleficarum uh, by a novelist who wrote uh, a, a woman's novel based on its terms. The Malleus was, was used as uh, a, a Bible for witch hunting. Uh, and um, it tells you how to identify witches and uh, how especially to interrogate them uh, and how to cure them, the cure usually being killing them. Uh, but the, the value of the malleus, I think, is twofold. It is um, probably the second known textbook in history on cross-examination techniques, the first one being the Platonic Dialogues. Uh, and so we get in the Malleus a systemization of the knowledge of how to do interrogations to lead people to get confessions that you want them to give. And so in the history of mind control, it plays a very important role uh, because this is, this is the, the, the work that was used uh, by the Inquisitors throughout the Middle Ages and thereafter uh, to obtain confessions and indeed false confessions. Uh, the Malleus itself then um, was read by police departments centuries later and used as the beginning of the development of police manuals. Uh, 
Let me jump ahead a couple of centuries uh, until last century, uh, the 1800s, with the birth of psychiatry. And it perhaps is no surprise that there is a common link to possession theories and the birth of psychiatry in that most psychiatric treatments uh, had the same element of violence that we see in the malleus and that we see in the exorcism uh, and beyond that. It's to cast the demons out. I'm going to run through a series of slides here, all taken from psychiatric uh, textbooks, uh, on the way in which people were treated. This one is an individual who was chained to a wall, and this is a, a, a form of a straitjacket, as you can see, where a person is tied directly to a drain pipe uh, in the wall. <clears throat> Here is an early version of the, uh, of the straitjacket itself. Uh, it, it, was, it was believed that these people were inhabited by demons uh, and that in order to get those demons out, exorcism was replaced either with violence or with severe restraint. Uh, but a century ago, they also had something that we tend to consider as modern, but is not shock treatment. The shock treatment done, however, was usually uh, a different form than electricity, since they had not yet invented electricity. This is a water shock treatment, and another version of it uh, appears here, where an individual is led blindfold on the platform, suddenly the platform falls from beneath him, and he's dumped into a bucket of ice-cold water. Uh, this was intended to be shocking. Uh, another form of shock treatment was to fire a cannon behind somebody without them knowing that was going to happen. Again, the idea was to use a, a form of violent cure uh, because of a theory of violent possession. Uh, interestingly enough, even electric shock as a history in antiquity, it did not. We did not need the development of electricity uh, to have electric shock. Uh, the ancient Egyptians used to take a torpedo fish and slap it on the forehead of people who were possessed, and the fish would discharge an electric current. And that's the earliest record of electric shock treatment. Uh, this is um, a device that nobody can ever guess the uh, importance of. It's an ovary compressor. And um, I'll leave it to your imagination to consider how painful uh, it must be to uh, have experienced it. Uh, seclusion, I, in its worst form, is the wooden crib here. Uh, this is a form of containment in which you can see the person is totally strapped into a crib uh, with no way to move. This, however, um, it was not the worst form of restraint. Uh, it took uh, a leading psychiatrist to develop that. <clears throat> this is the rotating chair. Um, a person could last only a few seconds in this chair without becoming nauseous and eventually losing consciousness. Uh, and then there was the tranquilizing chair. Uh, all of these devices were used in the late 1800s. The last two of them were developed by Benjamin Rush, uh, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, and his face appears on the seal of the American Psychiatric Association as its founder. Uh, it's not my desire to uh, criticize uh, psychiatry here, but rather to make the point in terms of mind control uh, that we began studying the human mind and mental illness with a theory of possession and a theory of cure based on violence. Uh, and from that, we'll see the various refinements. Perhaps the first of the refinements, and the one that's notoriously wrong, was the leading psychological theory of the 1800s, and that is phrenology, that you could measure the exterior of the brain, uh, or rather of the, the skull, uh, in order to understand the interior of the, of the mind. Uh, and uh, this is an illustration of a phrenologist's chart that the theory being that there is a direct correlation between a person's characteristics uh, as an individual uh, and the, uh, the, their skulls uh, and the lumps and other uh, aspects to be found on the skull. The theory, of course, is completely wrong, but it occupied a good deal of the 1800s and was the leading uh, theory of psychology at that time. Uh, it led uh, to further variants uh, in terms of face reading, 
the importance of the theory is not that it was wrong, but rather that it led people to begin to try to measure internal states. Uh, and so from an erroneous theory, people began to look inside the brain to see how you can find external correlations uh, with the brain. And we come across what I think is the, is the great paradox in all of healing, and that is that the more you learn how to cure people, the more you learn how to harm them. And for every step forward in relieving mental illness, you can take a step backwards in causing it. Uh, and so for people whose interest is in control of the mind, uh, their data comes from how to help the mind. And so there is no step forward that does not involve equally in the hands of malevolent people a step backwards. Uh, the idea of mind control turned more serious, however, and our concerns more contemporary uh, when we come to hypnosis. This is Hypnos, the Greek god of sleep. Uh, of course, hypnosis is not sleep, and so the name itself uh, is deceptive as to the, the mechanism of hypnosis. Uh, but hypnosis began the modern era with Mesmer, whose theories were also wrong uh, on uh, planet, not only wrong, but plagiarized uh, on uh, interplanetary uh, planetary magnetism uh, affecting uh, mental states and so forth. W what Mesmer really happened upon without realizing it was the beginning of the, the idea of the laws of suggestion. Uh, and what he did is set a, uh, up uh, what's called a baquette. And you can see here it's an oak tub from which uh, iron bars extrude uh, and the French nobility would come and touch the iron bars, which were uh, in the tub. The tub was filled with water, with iron filings, uh, and people would then have convulsive states, uh, which were pleasant enough for them to repeat uh, quite frequently. Uh, some slides of the baquette. This, this was high society, uh, not only treatment, but also entertainment. You can see at the left, a woman has fainted. Um, that was quite common. Uh, here's a, a, a color slide uh, of, of the same kind of event. Uh, Mesmer was, uh, work was studied by a presidential commission, uh, or rather a, a, a king's commission. Uh, king Louis XVI appointed uh, a special commission to study mesmerism. Um, <clears throat> at the time, it was receiving rave notices from the public and condemnation from medical societies. Here's a, a cartoon at the time of animal magnetism. You can see the animal doing uh, the hypnosis uh, and another uh, cartoon uh, debunking animal magnetism. The report that was issued uh, on the work of Mesmer's uh, student, Deslon, was uh, highly critical. The commission found that there was nothing to the interplanetary theories uh, and the magnetic theories, uh, but they were then forced to explain why Mesmer got so many cures. And they attributed the cures to the power of imagination. And rather than study the power of imagination as a way to cure individuals, uh, the commission left the issue alone, and it took a 100 years for people to pick up that essential point that manipulation of the imagination could be used to manipulate the mind. The uh, commission also issued a secondary report that was uh, stamped eyes only, uh, for the king's eyes only. And in that report, the commissioner said that there was an aspect of, of magnetism that was so dangerous that the practice should be stopped at once. It was a menace to morals, that the, the uh, attraction that developed between the magnetizer and the, the subject being magnetized was so great that seductions were inevitable. Uh, and therefore, we have the first inkling of the relationship between hypnosis and hypnotic seduction uh, in this secret report uh, for the, the king's eyes only. <clears throat> Mesmer died in disgrace and in exile uh, after the report appeared. Uh, and hypnosis, uh, which was still called animal magnetism of the time, fell into disgrace, but not uh, into complete abandonment. It wasn't until about 50 or 60 years later that James Braid, a Scottish physician, coined the term hypno uh, hypnosis and hypnotism, uh, and it wasn't until uh, about 50 years after that 
that hypnosis begins to be studied uh, in a serious way and the problems of mind control using hypnosis uh, as the vehicle again resurface. The, the Victorians were interested in hypnosis because it was fun to be hypnotized. They, they lacked the joys that we have, such as Geraldo, and so um, they had to entertain themselves by using hypnosis uh, for their parlor games, and you can see a, a man here drinking milk out of a saucer uh, on the floor. Uh, he had just been hypnotized. And so stage hypnosis uh, at the turn of the century, the, from the 1890s through the 1910s and 20s, uh, was one of the most uh, well-known and well-attended and lucrative forms uh, of entertainment. Um, just a couple of, of artifacts from that period of time. Here's a brochure uh, from a stage hypnotism show. Um, uh, <clears throat> Walter uh, Bodie, um, an English hypnotist, um, was perhaps one of the most famous uh, of the stage performers. He had a hypnosis and electrical show. Uh, you can see on there the, a statement, the real trilby um, of going back to Svengali, we'll return to that in a moment. Uh, this is James Bodie. Uh, he lives on in history for a reason people don't remember anymore, and that is he was the inspiration for an extremely young comic who got his start by mimicking Bodie. And here's the young comic. Here's the two of them together Bodie on the right and Charlie Chaplin on the left. And so Charlie Chaplin's career began by studying Bodhi's mechanisms uh, and his mannerisms on stage and then making um, comedy of them. Uh, during, the middle, during the Victorian era, uh, people's exposure to hypnosis was not only as a form of entertainment, but it seemed like a form of mind control as well. You could get people to do anything that you asked of them. Um, you could have them be suspended between two chairs. You could even stand on them when they're suspended between two chairs. Uh, and you could do uh, a lot worse as well. Uh, if you're sensitive, please don't watch the next two slides. This is an iron bar held by um, uh, eyelids put into the eyelids of a subject. Uh, and this is a stage hypnotist in Georgia. And as if that isn't bad enough to suspend an iron bar from the eyelids, he took it one step further and then pulled a young woman on, on roller skates. So it's not always fun to be hypnotized. And some people have taken the idea of stage hypnosis, it seems to me, far beyond where um, it should be entitled to go. One of those people is Barry Konikoff, uh, who uh, traffics under the name of Potentials Unlimited. Uh, in, in one of his later... Uh, he, he has self-hypnosis tapes, which were available all over the place. I've heard he's gone uh, bankrupt now, and I certainly hope that's true. Uh, in his later round of tapes, he argued that women who have been sexually abused or raped uh, deserve it uh, because of what they did in prior lives. Now, the First Amendment uh, perhaps protects that. I, uh, on the other hand, um, <clears throat> it is, there aren't words that would describe a person who would make money out of that kind of a theory, so I won't waste our time on him. I want to get back to the central theme of mind control, which starts with uh, Jean-Martin Charcot, uh, who was the foremost neurologist at the time. While the stage hypnotists were persuading people that minds could be controlled uh, by hypnosis, the uh, professionals were learning hypnosis as well, and they were learning it largely from a, a small group of people, the most influential of whom was Charcot. Uh, Charcot, as the greatest neurologist in Europe at the time, was frequently visited by kings and princes and certainly all of the uh, most elite of the medical profession from around the world. And in his clinic at La Salpetriere in, in Paris, he would demonstrate uh, hypnotic phenomenon. He would, uh, in his demonstrations, induce uh, neurotic symptoms in people, uh, people who came in with an inability to move one limb uh, in hypnosis would be able to move that limb, but he would transfer the neurotic symptom to the other limb, uh, and so he could create and destroy and eliminate and transpose uh, neurotic conditions. 
Uh, and this was a remarkable demonstration uh, which impressed uh, a number of people in the audience. Uh, but his theories were at odds with his major contemporaries, uh, Libo, who was on the left, and Hippolyte Bernheim, who was on the right. Uh, there was, in France at the time, this second school of thought about hypnosis. Charcot believed that people who could be hypnotized were hysterics and that hypnosis was a form of hysterical dissociation. Bernheim, uh, based on the work of uh, Libo uh, and his own work thereafter, believed that hypnosis was a form of suggestion and that the manipulation of suggestion uh, did not need a former neurotic condition. Here's Bernheim. Bernheim and Charcot often appeared against each other in a series of, of uh, criminal cases that appeared throughout France uh, on the issue of the antisocial production uh, of uh, crime with hypnosis. A person who studied from both of these people and was influenced by both of them was Sigmund Freud. This is a picture of him on his wedding day uh, and a, a, a better known portrait of him in his old age. Uh, and then the infamous couch. In his London office, over the couch, Freud had a picture of Charcot doing the demonstration that I showed you a few slides back. Let me get to that. This was the, a picture that hung over uh, the couch in Freud's office uh, in, in, uh, in England. Now, Freud was very much influenced by the hypnosis theories uh, and worked with hypnosis for a year, but then abandoned it. And it wasn't clear why he did abandon hypnosis. <clears throat> Some theorists have argued, and I think correctly, that he was a lousy hypnotist, and uh, that seemed to be true. Uh, and he couldn't, uh, as a result, uh, get deep enough trances to have effect on his, on his patients. Uh, other theorists have argued, and Freud's own writings tend to support a secondary uh, hypothesis, and that is that Freud was scared of the seductive power of hypnosis, um, that the, the ability to move people into altered states of consciousness gave a feeling to the hypnotist of some such omnipotence that it was in itself seductive. And Freud wrote that in one of his patients, as soon as the hypnotic encounter had ended, she jumped up and threw her arms around him uh, and hugged and kissed him. And he did not attribute that to his, his, his handsome uh, uh, demeanor. He said it must be some other force at work, and it so frightened him, he said, that he never used hypnosis again. And I think that he's harking back to the Mesmer Commission's noticing that there is a manipulative power in hypnosis that the subject may not be able to resist, but also the hypnotizer may not be able to resist as well. Um, Bernheim, by the way, and Albert Moll, a German hypnotist in the 1880s and 1890s, uh, had already given the world the, the false memory syndrome. They called it retroactive hallucinations at the time, and they wrote quite openly in their works uh, that they were concerned that through the power of suggestion, you could create an impenetrable witness for a court of law, that by hypnotizing somebody, you could induce them to tell a false story. That story would be impervious to cross-examination because the individual would sincerely believe in the truth of what he or she was saying and therefore you would never be able to effectively cross-examine that person because they would continually insist on the truth of what they were reporting. Uh, and so in the eight, by, by the early uh, 1890s, the phenomenon of false memory had already um, <clears throat> been noted and been written about extensively, and its application to courts of law had already been written about. There is absolutely nothing new in the false memory issue. It's simply a failure to read the literature from a hundred years ago. What's more important is where are we going to go from now with false memory? Uh, and I think the answer is where we have already come from a hundred years ago. The next step beyond false memory uh, was the beginning to use these techniques deliberately for the purpose of mind control. And essentially the first steps are taken by A.R. Luria uh, in his institute in Moscow. 
and lure your reason that if you can get people to have false confessions uh, with hypnosis, you probably could build affective complexes on those false confessions. In other words, you could not only get people to report things that never happened, you could get them to experience the entire range of emotions affiliated with those events. Uh, and so Luria and his colleagues in Moscow in the 1920s uh, began doing research on developing neuroses built upon the implantation of false memories. That work was replicated in the 1930s by Milton Erickson, uh, Lawrence QB, and others uh, who verified the uh, truth of what Luria was, was um, reporting. Now, Luria's work was not merely academic. It had its operational uses in the next decade uh, in the Moscow show trials, uh, which are an extremely important historical event for our purposes. During the Moscow show trials, uh, Stalin purged his old enemies. Now, one way you can do that is simply have them disappear, or you could have public executions. It is generally true throughout histories that regimes try to improve their own legitimacy by discrediting their predecessors. Stalin's way of doing it was to put on trial all his former friends. And what was different about the Moscow show trials is that when these defendants went on trial, they not only confessed to a series of crimes and sins they could not possibly have committed, but they begged to be shot as enemies of the state. Uh, some recent books uh, on the prosecutor's role uh, in programming uh, uh, in the, during the Moscow show trials have added some new information uh, to our understanding of them. Uh, it was at this point that American intelligence agencies began to take notice of the mind control potential that seemed to be apparent from the Moscow show trials. The actual paper record, though, is hard to trace uh, from the 1930s, easier to trace from the 1940s. Uh, and the trial that ultimately set the CIA off on its investigation of uh, mind control was the trial of Cardinal Menzente. Menzente was a staunch anti-communist who was then arrested by the communists and put in the Andrasi Street prison uh, in, in Hungary. Uh, the, uh, six months later, he was put on trial and as the, his predecessors a decade before, he confessed to crimes and sins that could not possibly have been true. These are a series of slides showing him at trial. The, the experience of, of Minzente um, was so frightening to American intelligence agencies uh, that they began to investigate whether or not the Soviets possessed some new form of mind control unknown to the West. And, and here, two stories develop that are both true and completely contradictory. Um, in secret CIA files, you will find both of these stories validated. On the one hand, the CIA argued that it was afraid that it was losing the war for control of the mind, and that the Soviets had developed this new sophisticated psychology or whatever, to control the way people would think and act. And the America had to catch up. We were on the defensive now, and we had to uh, a lot of work that had to be done. On the other hand, um, in a document that was extremely highly classified, eyes only uh, for the director of the CIA's eyes only, um, it turned out that there was a spy in the Andrasi Street prison who was reporting back to the CIA everything that was happening to Minzente. And this, this uh, eyes-only report, uh, which I've read, is a wonderful document. It, it details uh, exactly what happened to Minzente. It names the um, Soviet hypnotists who did the work and the drugs that they used to assist them in that work. It's a step-by-step -step manual uh, for the programming of Menzente. And what's particularly interesting is if you read Cardinal Menzente's autobiography of the events, he really doesn't know what happened to him. And at this point, the CIA had a better knowledge of the programming of Menzente than he had of his own programming. 
And so on the one hand, the Soviets, the, the CIA knew everything that the Soviets were, were doing, yet on the other hand, they were reporting that they were afraid that they were um, losing the war. And I think both of those stories are true, though they're contradictory and both are supported by secret CIA documents. Um, Meanwhile, um, a related event is, is begins to happen. In the late 1940s, Edward Hunter, um, in 1949, for the first time, coins the term brainwashing uh, and writes a book uh, on it. This is one of the two books that, that Hunter uh, wrote. It turned out that, that Hunter was an OSS and then later CIA propagandist. And the word brainwashing was particularly useful because American prisoners of war were starting to give confessions of using germ warfare uh, during the Korean War. And America needed a way of, of uh, stopping that kind of propaganda. And the term brainwashing, which had been coined by Hunter to explain the thought reform program uh, in communist China, uh, proved a useful vehicle. Uh, this is Edward Hunter. I had... I was able to do one of the last interviews with him uh, bef before his death. Um, in in the in the deep literature on brainwashing, uh, the more academic literature on brainwashing, uh, his view of it is called the robot theory, the notion that with brainwashing techniques you can turn somebody into an automaton. Uh, the robot theory of brainwashing is not the only theory of brainwashing, uh, but it is the, the most uh, flamboyant, uh, and in, in, it's also the most frightening. The idea of brainwashing then in the 1950s became the object of a lot of study uh, and writing uh, in books like In Every War But One. People who had actually gone through the experience wrote about what had happened to them, and researchers like uh, Biderman uh, in, in, in books like this um, were reporting what happened to American uh, prisoners of war and other prisoners of war. Uh, in Hawaii, an American camp was set up uh, to be a mock prison of war camp to use the techniques that were being used of brainwashing. This is a, an, il an illustration from that camp. These are actually all Americans, but it's a simulated exercise in brainwashing because Americans were searching for a way to inoculate uh, our soldiers uh, if they should get captured and put through a brainwashing experience, would it have been possible for us to inoculate them previously so the brainwashing would not, uh, would not take? While the brainwashing studies were going on, another development was happening simultaneously important to the development of mind control, and these are the sensory deprivation experiments um, that began in Canada uh, with Donald Hebb uh, and others. It was Hebb's original work was, was essentially on what's called um, highway trance, uh, the, the phenomena that people who will drive on highways and long stretches of road that, that's pretty monotonous will go into trance. And this is a form of sensory deprivation. If you've got, if it's, if it's dark at night, there's a long road, there's no scenery. Um, you, you probably all have had the experience of realizing you've suddenly driven a couple of miles but have no memory. Uh, for that couple of miles passing, or you've gotten very drowsy. Well, the phenomenon of sensory deprivation uh, became the subject of a good deal of study in the 1950s. What would happen to the mind if it were deprived of sensory input, since the mind needs sensory input the way the body needs food? Uh, and in a series of studies, this is on isolation, um, inside the black room, students in, in universities across the country, in Canada and other places, were put in a black room. Here's an illustration of it. There, there's uh, essentially almost no sensory input at all. Uh, what happens to the mind? Uh, flotation tanks uh, and, and other ways of decreasing sensory input uh, all had the effect of causing the mind when it is deprived of sensory input to throw out a hallucinated world uh, in order to get input back from that hallucinated world. And people, in fact, kept in isolation too long um, could become psychotic. Uh, books 
studying the phenomena of isolation and also in conjunction with manipulating people's mind through techniques of brainwashing began to appear. Uh, the Brain Benders is one. The Battle for the Mind by William Sargent is the foremost British book on this subject. Uh, Robert J. Lifton's study, Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism, is the classic work on the Chinese thought reform program. Edgar Schein's book on coercive persuasion, on the, um, the Americans uh, taken prisoner during the Korean War, uh, Rape of the Mind by Mirlu, another classic. Um, as all of this was happening, this was what you would you could call a, a form of coercive persuasion, as Shine had suggested. Uh, but there was another event that was occurring um, simultaneously. The 1950s is in many ways the birth of mind control experimentation, because you have the brainwashing issue, the hypnosis issues, uh, the isolation and sensory deprivation studies, and you now get the the, the next stream of research. Uh, which involves um, obedience to authority studies. Uh, I mentioned the other night Solomon Ash's study on opinions and social pressure, and what, what Ash did at Yale was the simplest of experiments on, on conformity. Uh, he drew on a blackboard a line that was one foot long and another line directly under it, parallel to it, that was two feet long. He then got six or seven people in a room uh, all of whom except one had been bribed. And he and the, the last one had no knowledge of the, the bribing of the others. He then asked them in order which one was the shorter line. And to the horror of the one who was not bribed, everyone reported that the two-foot line was the shorter line. And it was visually obvious that that was untrue, but everybody else in the room was reporting it as true. And what Ash discovered was that the subject would report seeing the longer line as the shorter line, that, that he would conform to peer pressure. Um, cynics dismissed it on the grounds that it just showed the stupidity of Yale graduates, uh, but that was not a sufficient scientific explanation. Uh, and uh, as Walter reported the other night, uh, the experiments were done in... Um, uh, in the Navy and other places as well. Now, I want to distinguish this group of work from the others that I, I, I've just reported on. Here we're talking about a form of manipulation of the mind that does not involve physical coercion. In the brainwashing work, uh, in the isolation work, there is a form of physical intimidation that involves taking over the body. Uh, and controlling the body, controlling all of the input in the mind, and so forth. And so this is a person in that situation knows that he or she is in that situation, that they are captive in some way. With this kind of experimentation, we have what I call conversational persuasion. This is the beginning of the attempt to, to develop theories of social influence on freestanding populations where people are not aware that they are being held captive in any way, and indeed they're not. Um, the next step along the lines of obedience research, and in some ways the most frightening, uh, is the work done by Milgram uh, and his book Obedience to Authority. And if you're not familiar with Milgram's work, I'll give you a very brief explanation of it. Uh, Milgram wanted to test the hypothesis that, uh, uh, that people in Germany, good people in Germany, uh, during the Nazi regime were um, manipulated in a way to do evil, or let me restate that, Milgram wondered why so many good people in Nazi Germany could allow such evil to happen around them knowingly. And his thesis was um, not the, 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 um, the idea that there's something inherent in the German character, but rather that there's something inherent in people. And he was interested in showing whether or not uh, if a Hitler-type character arose in the United States, that person would uh, be able to get good people to do evil in this country. And so he built a box. I don't have a, a slide of it 
here, he built a box with 30 switches, just little light switches. And the 30 switches were in 15 volt increments. They were marked in, in 15 volt increments. Um, as you moved over towards the right of the box, there began to be some writing um, which said caution, danger, extreme danger, and the last group of, of switches were marked in triple red X's. Now, he then put an advertisement, uh, again, this is at Yale, so you know, maybe the cynics are right. Uh, he, he put, um, he put a, an advertisement in the local uh, New Haven newspaper for people to volunteer for the experiment. Um, people came in and they were told that the experiment involved pain and learning and that they would be the teachers and that there was a student and they could see the student. And the student, they were told, was hooked up to an electric grid. And every time the, the teacher was to give the student a question, and every time the student gave a wrong answer, one of the switches was to be pushed. When Milgram and his associates talked about the experiment, they concluded that nobody would push all the switches, and most people would stop pushing the switches about halfway through, because each switch was intended to deliver a higher voltage shock. The subject as about half the switches were pulled, would increasingly flinch and then scream and then yell, would then say, I don't want to do this anymore, would then say, I have a heart condition, please stop, and then would refuse to answer any question and would slump over. If the, if the teacher balked at pushing the next switch, there was an experimenter there in a long white laboratory coat uh, with a clipboard and a pencil who was instructed to say first continue and then please continue and then you must go on with the experiment and finally uh, I will take responsibility. And what Milgram discovered is that the overwhelming number of people pushed all of the switches and that the, the simple reinforcement of saying, I will take responsibility, or that, that there was an experiment going on, was sufficient to allow them to do that. Now, uh, the after Milgram's experiments were replicated in other places, um, and um, what eventually evolved is that the horror of what he was proving was so ghastly that the scientific literature turned away from it and instead focused on the ethics of doing that kind of experiment. Because after all, what he was doing is taking people from the street um, and not telling them that they were what he was studying. They thought he was studying the subject. And a lot of these people, as you can imagine, uh, had severe emotional reaction uh, once they realized that they had shocked somebody with a heart condition uh, on a machine that went beyond, beyond extreme danger to triple X's in red. Uh, and so the ethics of doing that kind of work um, then um, created a movement in, in universities and other places uh, for uh, institutional review boards, etc. And the research can't be done anymore. And what Milgram was proving, how easy it is to manipulate people by the simplest of commands, um, I was no longer being uh, studied and certainly not in that manner. Uh, but books like Compliant Behavior Beyond Obedience to Authority uh, and were, were being written um, to increase and replicate and extend the work of Milgram. Uh, and here's a report called Conformity, Compliance, and Conversion uh, from an Air Force in, I think, around the 1950s, uh, an Air Force report uh, using Milgram's work uh, in Air Force conditioning. Uh, let me give me a moment, take a break. I want to change the slides for the next um, the next carousel. Let's go back and talk some more about hypnosis, um, since it plays a central role uh, in the rest of the development of mind control. Let me say that that also, uh, given the nature of the subject of mind control. There are a lot of things I'm not talking about. I'm not going to be talking to you about the physiological aspects of mind control to take you through the lobotomy and psychosurgery and electrical stimulation of the brain literature. 
and I won't be talking about the pharmacological aspects of mind control, the use of drugs and, and uh, botanicals and chemicals uh, for mind control. You know, that, but that should give you an idea of how vast the subject is. Uh, we, we're just concentrating here on the psychological aspects of, of mind control. All right. The, the notion of hypnotic seduction had been noticed uh, in the secret report to the, uh, to the king in, in France. It had been noticed by um, Freud uh, in his work, and it had been noticed by, by many others, a series of, of slides uh, on hypnotic seduction. It put the, the idea of hypnotic seduction uh, got, I think, its, its greatest impetus uh, in an 1894 book uh, called Trilby. And this is an illustration from it with the infamous Svengali as the hypnotist. And to this day, the portrait of Svengali as a hypnotist is almost as powerful as Sherlock Holmes as a detective. It's almost the stereotype of the field. Um, it, it, Trilby it, today um, would be... Um, a, a number one bestseller, uh, the equivalent of a number one bestseller, uh, and even bigger. It was probably the first blockbuster novel. It was published in a magazine in serial form, and after the first issue appeared, the magazine had to print an additional 100,000 copies because of the desire for people to continue the story. Um, it it, the uh, author, George du Maurier, was launched into such public um, light that he ultimately hid from all, in order to preserve his privacy. He had lecture tours through the United States and, and Britain. It, you remember Peyton Place, that, how huge a novel that was at the time? Uh, this was the equivalent and even, and even bigger. The story of Trilby um, is the story of a hypnotist who gets total control over the personality of a young woman. Um, and the, the novel itself, I find to be incredibly boring. Uh, but the portrait uh, portrayed in, uh, of the hypnotist uh, is tremendously exciting and has lived on almost as an icon uh, of the subject itself. There was a town in Florida, and I haven't checked to see whether this is still true, that changed its name to Trilby. Uh, and uh, in the center of town, they have Svengali Square. Uh, there were Trilby parties, Trilby hats, Trilby clothes. Uh, it was an enormously popular uh, and influential novel, which introduced people to the idea of the potential for hypnotic uh, seduction, and also uh, even worse. Let me, since I don't want to dwell on this aspect of mind control, let me sum it up and say that the the traditional thinking has been that you cannot get people to do with hypnosis what they would not otherwise do. There is value in that thinking because it, it then doesn't encourage people to try. But if you go and talk to the hypnotist who will tell you that, and you talk to them in private, they will tell you the opposite story. That within certain parameters you can get people to do things they would otherwise not do with hypnosis. And that while their hypnosis is not a magic wand or a magic potion, it is an effective facilitator uh, for seduction or antisocial conduct. There is an increase in court cases of hypnotic seduction now. But I want to turn to the more frightening prospect of using hypnosis for uh, the, the creation of antisocial crimes. Um, can you get, uh, you are in by power, you will do what I tell you. How far can you get control of somebody uh, using hypnosis and forms of social influence? Uh, this has been the subject of a lot of fiction. Um, just from my library, here are some of the books. Uh, the Darker the Night was the hypnotist, the killer. Um, seeing is believing. Your eyelids are growing heavy. Murder is suggested. Telephone, which of course is a is a movie as well, um, and there are academic books like Hypnotism and Crime. Uh, interestingly, there there has been no major work 
on the antisocial aspects of hypnosis, either in the legal literature or in the uh, psychiatric, hypnotic, or psychological literature for over 30 years. 1960 is the last time we have a, a full discussion. Uh, of, of the issue of hypnotic coercion, and 1972 was the last time a hypnosis journal directed itself primarily to that issue. Uh, the texts suggest um, that there are cases in which people, through hypnosis, have been induced to commit crimes, but the hypnosis community has been divided as to whether those are pure cases. Uh, there is what I call the methodological dilemma that arises at this point. If, if you, uh, usually the hypnotic encounter requires a certain amount of time and a certain amount of trust. And so hypnosis researchers argue that it's not hypnosis that facilitates either seduction or the production of antisocial acts. Rather, it is the relationship between the hypnotist and the subject, and therefore hypnosis is not at fault. The experimentalists discount any clinical anecdotal material because it's not rigorously scientific and therefore can't prove the conclusion of hypnotic coercion. But the experimental literature itself is discounted because, as Albert Mole wrote a hundred years ago, and Martin Orn has written as well, uh, at some level a subject always knows that he or she is participating in an experiment. And so there is no way to test the validity of the hypothesis that you can induce uh, co through hypnosis antisocial conduct. On the other hand, such conduct is produced on a regular basis, whatever the explanation. Uh, the one place where the studies were done, where there was no fear of uh, ethical violation or legal uh, 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 consequences uh, was in work done by the Central Intelligence Agency. And since the work has never been um, fully published, uh, I have an article that will be coming out in the American Journal of Clinical Hypnosis on the, uh, the CIA hypnosis experiments. It's not, it's not my function here to criticize the intelligence agencies or to condemn what they have done. I'm instead trying to uh, argue the point that uh, the hypnosis community in general, and psychologists and psychiatrists as well, need to know the data that was produced and which still exists in CIA files. If we are going to be accused by the false memory people of using undue suggestion to get people to do things they wouldn't otherwise do, we need to know the limits of those possibilities. And that material is in CIA files. Therapists are being sued across the country. Uh, they need access to that information. Uh, to help defend themselves. And so it is in the spirit of science and in the spirit of protecting therapists and patients um, you know, for the good of the country uh, that I present this material so that we can hope that the full amount of it is uh, ultimately revealed. I also must make a caveat. I can only report on information that I've seen either through my search of CIA files uh, uh, and, and, and my interviews with, with um, CIA hypnotists and other hypnotists. There may be mistakes in what I present. I cannot correct that unless I have access to all of the material. And so if I have made a mistake, um, it, is, it is a mistake that comes from not being given the material because uh, I have in good faith worked through the material I have to tell as accurate a story as, as, as I know how. Um, the CIA began experimenting as soon as it was born uh, in, in the late 1940s. Uh, the experimentation and mind and behavior control had already begun in the OSS uh, with hypnosis experiments, uh, truth serums, uh, truth tablets, and uh, lethal pills. Uh, as well as other kinds of experiments, but it was after the Cardinal Menzente uh, episode that the CIA began to really become concerned about the possibility of, of hypnotic uh, coercion. And um, let me quote to you uh, from a CIA document at the time. Uh, 
Uh, this is a February 10th, 1951 CIA top secret memo called Defense Against Soviet Medical Interrogation and Espionage Techniques. Quote, hypnotism has been reported to have been used in some cases by the Soviets as an adjunct to interrogation. It would be possible for a skilled Soviet operator to lower a prisoner's resistance to questioning and yet leave him with no specific recollections of having been interrogated. With respect to inducing specific action on the part of the subject by hypnotism, it would be possible to brief a prisoner or other individual, subsequently dispatch him on a mission, and successfully debrief him on his return without his recollection of the whole proceeding. A June 1951 CIA memo says, quote, CIA interest is in the specific subject of devising scientific methods for controlling the minds of individuals, unquote. And so by 19, uh, in, the, in the late 1940s, um, some essentially uncontrolled experimentation was begun by various people within the CIA, and a more structured program was also undertaken, which had the name Bluebird, and that name was then changed to Artichoke. And under Projects Bluebird and Artichoke, um, the attempt was made to bring together all known knowledge of interrogation techniques, truth serums, polygraphs, and hypnosis to create essentially an elite interrogation team uh, with facility in all of those uh, endeavors and have them do the work um, that would be needed, first of all, to protect against infiltration by enemy agents and also to protect the minds of American agents who might get captured by uh, communist uh, individuals. We've been listening to Dr. Alan Shefflin give a lecture on the history of mind control, what we can prove and what we can't. We're going to be continuing with that lecture next week. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, we're in the middle of a, an extended radio series on mind control. Um, I hope that uh, this lecture and uh, some of the other uh, interviews and lectures uh, have set the background um, of mind control to uh, contextualize uh, what we're going to be featuring on upcoming shows, we're going to hear from survivors, uh, their accounts of their experiences with uh, government mind control experiments and uh, how they were used by their government. You've been listening to The International Connection here on CKLN 88.1. Stay tuned next for Aquí Nuestra America. It is Sunday morning at 9.30 and welcome to another International Connection. You're listening to 88.1 CKLN. We've been in the middle of an extended series on mind control here on the International Connection. This is week number 11, and we have heard so far, if you haven't uh, been uh, listening the last uh, few months, a uh, lecture by Dr. Colin Ross and an interview with Colin Ross about the uh, U.S. government, uh, CIA, and military's use in creating Manchurian candidates by using multiple personality disorder. And uh, we also heard... Uh, testimony given at the radiation hearings um, of survivors of this, and uh, we also heard the story of Ronald Howard Cohen, uh, a writer and activist that was abducted and drugged by CIA military. We're hearing this week part two of a lecture given by Dr. Alan Shefflin, and this is entitled The History of Mind Control, What We Can Prove and What We Can't. And this was given back in 1985, or rather 95, in Dallas, Texas at a uh, conference. And we're going to listen to part two today. It's not my function here to criticize the intelligence agencies or to condemn what they have done. I'm instead trying to uh, argue the point that uh, the hypnosis community in general, and psychologists and psychiatrists as well, need to know the data that was produced and which still exists in CIA files. If we are going to be accused by the false memory people of using undue suggestion to get people to do things they wouldn't otherwise do, we need to know the limits of those possibilities. And that material is in CIA files. Therapists are being sued across the country. Uh, they need access to that information 
information uh, to help defend themselves. And so it is in the spirit of science and in the spirit of protecting therapists and patients, um, you know, for the good of the country uh, that I present this material so that we can hope that the full amount of it is uh, ultimately revealed. I also must make a caveat. I can only report on information that I've seen either through my search of CIA files uh, uh, and, and, and my interviews with, with um, CIA hypnotists and other hypnotists. There may be mistakes in what I present. I cannot correct that unless I have access to all of the material. And so if I have made a mistake, um, it, is, it is a mistake that comes from not being given the material because uh, I have in good faith worked through the material I have to tell as accurate a story as, as, as I know how. Um, the CIA began experimenting as soon as it was born uh, in, in the late 1940s. Uh, the experimentation in mind and behavior control had already begun in the OSS uh, with hypnosis experiments, uh, truth serums, uh, truth tablets, and uh, lethal pills, uh, as well as other kinds of experiments. But it was after the Cardinal Menzente uh, episode that the CIA began to really become concerned about the possibility of, of hypnotic uh, coercion. And um, let me quote to you uh, from a CIA document at the time. <clears throat> Uh, this is a February 10th, 1951 CIA top secret memo called Defense Against Soviet Medical Interrogation and Espionage Techniques. Quote, hypnotism has been reported to have been used in some cases by the Soviets as an adjunct to interrogation. It would be possible for a skilled Soviet operator to lower a prisoner's resistance to questioning and yet leave him with no specific recollections of having been interrogated. With respect to inducing specific action on the part of the subject by hypnotism, it would be possible to brief a prisoner or other individual, subsequently dispatch him on a mission, and successfully debrief him on his return without his recollection of the whole proceeding. A June 1951 CIA memo says, quote, CIA interest is in the specific subject of devising scientific methods for controlling the minds of individuals, unquote. And so by 19, uh, in, the, in the late 1940s, um, some essentially uncontrolled experimentation was begun by various people within the CIA, and a more structured program was also undertaken, which had the name Bluebird, and that name was then changed to Artichoke, and under Projects Bluebird and Artichoke, um, the attempt was made to bring together all known knowledge of interrogation techniques, truth serums, polygraphs, and hypnosis to create essentially an elite interrogation team uh, with facility in all of those uh, endeavors and have them do the work um, that would be needed, first of all, to protect against infiltration by enemy agents and also to protect the minds of American agents who might get captured by uh, communist uh, individuals. Uh, uh, the, in 1950, the early 1950s, uh, Walter Smith, the director of Central Intelligence, uh, in an eyes-only memo, um, said, wanted to know, he issued an, an order that he wanted an answer to the, the question, quote, whether effective practical techniques exist whereby an individual can be caused to become subservient to an imposed control and subsequently that individual be unaware of the event, unquote. Um, and so the purpose of the CIA experiments by the early 1950s was to discover the ways to control the minds of individuals. Uh, and Bluebird and Artichoke were one part of it. Uh, there were other parts as, as well. The, the CIA's facility in Langley um, did not exist at that time. Uh, they used office buildings throughout the Washington area and safe houses in around the country and throughout the world. Um, eventually, the uh, in 1953, we get a new program uh, from the CIA, which is the most uh, expansive 
mind control program in the history of the world. Uh, its genesis begins uh, in 1953 with a speech given by Alan Dulles, who was the new CIA director. Um, uh, in his speech, uh, Dulles said uh, that we were losing control um, of the, the battle of the mind, uh, that, that we were at war with the Soviet Union. He called it brain warfare, uh, and the Soviets possessed knowledge which uh, the United States did not. Um, a memo uh, two months later, uh, in June 1953, a top secret memo, states, quote, interrogations of the individuals who had come out of North Korea across the Soviet Union to freedom recently had apparently experienced a blank period or a period of disorientation while passing through a special zone in Manchuria. By 1953, in other words, that the notion of the Manchurian candidate, almost in those exact terms, uh, had been theorized by the CIA. I'll come back to that point uh, in, in a moment. Um, but in Dulles's public speech in, in uh, April 10th, 1953, to Princeton alumni in um, Hot Springs, West Virginia, uh, he argued that uh, we had to do something to make sure we did not lose the war uh, with the Soviet Union. Uh, and three, uh, about a week and a half later, he signed into law what was called uh, MK Ultra, all capital letters. Walter has speculated, and I think it's a good speculation, that the MK stands for mind control, and Ultra was the code name given to the to breaking the uh, the, the Japanese and German codes, and so this was the code name given to breaking the code of the human mind. MK Ultra was 149 subprojects. It was the umbrella for 149 subprojects, uh, all of them uh, under the auspices of Sidney Gottlieb, and later directed by his boss Richard Helms. The um, 149 subprojects. You can read something about this in government documents. Um, this is a project MK Ultra. Uh, from a uh, joint hearing of, uh, I think it's the yeah, United States Senate, and so the material, some of the material um, has been made public by the by the Congress. Uh, other material uh, has has not uh, been made public, but the the existence of MK Ultra, you know, is not is not a a, a secret, uh, and its its contours are are known to some extent. The uh, purpose, uh, another government document also explore some of the same territory um, on bio, this one is, is on biomedical uh, research, um, biomedical and behavioral research by the government. Specific, the, the goal of all 149 subprojects was mind and behavior control. Some of them involved botanical, some of them involved things like psychosurgery and electrical stimulation of the brain. Nine of the subprojects involved hypnosis. Uh, some of the subprojects involve things like voodoo. One of them involves circumcision to create anxiety and then manipulate the anxiety. Uh, and uh, almost anything you could think of and things you wouldn't think of as ways to control the mind were funded and studied. Uh, maybe one of the more well-known studies and one of the most notorious now is the work that was done by you and Cameron in Canada. Cameron was the president uh, of the Canadian Psychiatric Association, the American Psychiatric Association, and the World Psychiatric Association. And uh, in his work in the 60s in, uh, at the Allen Memorial Institute uh, in Montreal, uh, he had a theory that sounds unique but actually exists in Brave New World Revisited, uh, and even goes back to the ancient Greeks, his notion was that you could completely erase a personality by regressing an individual back to an infantile state, um, a process he called depatterning, and then you could program that individual with a new personality 
a process he called psychic driving. In order to destroy the original personality, Cameron put his subjects uh, to sleep for up to two months, injected them with LSD, mescaline, and other psychoactive chemicals, uh, and um, essentially engaged in, in a form of regression therapy. Um, age regression may be a hypnotic phenomena, but this was, in a sense, an actual regression. This was the, the attempt to, to manipulate people back to a state of infantilism. What, when was this? These were the um, 1960s. Yeah. These were people who came to him because um, they were depressed uh, or because they were, in, in other words, th this was the local psychiatric institute. And you, you went there if you needed help. Let me continue because um, I've got a lot more to cover. Uh, I'll take questions after. The, um, one of the people who came to him, I don't have a slide of her, but I've done some TV shows with her, uh, was the wife of a member of the Canadian Parliament. Uh, Val Olikoff was her name. She's dead now. Uh, and Val had just had a baby, and she was suffering, I think, from postpartum depression. Liz Liz didn't feel she was able to care for her baby or for herself, and in general she was feeling um, unequal to the task of wifehood and motherhood. And her husband suggested that maybe she could benefit from some psychiatric care, and she thought that that was a good idea, and she, they made the mistake of winding up going to you and Cameron. Uh, and Cameron destroyed her life, and she, along with, I think, 10 or 11 other people, ultimately sued the Canadian government and the Central Intelligence Agency. The CIA uh, contributed funding to you and Cameron's experiments. Um, there was uh, 60 Minutes did a story on this that I show at meetings from time to time. Uh, one of the people went there because he was um, he was feeling badly, and he went through the same kind of process, and they later discovered that he had a minor skin disease, and a single shot of cortisone would have cured him. But his life was ruined, and as he put it, he said, where do I go for help? Um, I don't trust any psychiatrist or psychologist or therapist anymore after what they did for me, and I know I need their help, and yet I've been programmed to not trust them. And so where do I go for relief? The experiments um, have been written about in detail uh, in a number of books. This is the least reliable, Gordon Thomas's Journey into Madness. Um, harder to find, a Canadian book, I swear by Apollo, is, is more accurate. Uh, perhaps the best of the books is Ann Collins' uh, In the Sleep Room. And in some ways, the most compelling um, and the, the most, um, I wouldn't want to say important, but the, 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 the one uh, most emotional, perhaps, is Harvey Weinstein's book. This is the Canadian edition, A Father, a Son, and the CIA, and it's slightly revised um, and it printed by the American Psychiatric Press um, uh, here. As, uh, can you lower that to the... It's, um, so that we can see the title. Is there somebody? No. Okay. Um, I don't have the title uh, here. It's something like uh, Psychiatry in the CIA. Okay. Uh, Harvey, um, Harvey's father was one of those people who was depressed and went into the Allen Memorial Institute and uh, as a human being and came out as a vegetable. Uh, he, he never did uh, become a whole human being again, uh, and indeed it was what happened to his father that led Harvey uh, into psychiatry. Um, and Harvey's conclusion is something that should be read, I think, by everybody in the mental health field. Um, after all of the knowledge of the CIA experiments and the Army experiments and Air Force and Navy experiments um, have come out, after all of what we know, not a single researcher has been subjected to a single lawsuit or even censure by a professional organization for work that was clearly illegal and clearly unethical 
at the t even at the time. And the message must be, if there are no consequences to doing these kinds of work, the work will continue. Uh, and indeed, you know, that, that's certainly most likely what has happened. Uh, and so Harvey's, Harvey's um, conclusion is that, that if the professional organizations are not going to step up and condemn this kind of experimentation, then it will be repeated and other generations will suffer the horror that his family suffered. Now, Cameron's experiment consist was a simply, uh, uh, you know, a part of the, the series of brainwashing tests um, to regress people back um, to this infantile state. Now, the Greeks had Greek uh, sleep temples uh, that had a similar focus, um, but modern technology added to Cameron's work uh, he used a tape loop. He would interview an individual. Um, you've heard about Erickson's power words and whatever. He would find words that were important to his patients. And he would program those words in messages that he would construct on tape loops that would be played into their brain a half to a, a million times to a million to a million and a half times. And so, in fact... Um, these people were quite literally programmed. Um, in a state of infantilism, uh, Cameron wrote that they could endure sensory deprivation indefinitely. Whereas most people would crack by about eight hours, these people could stay there indefinitely. The psychic driving in which the tape loops were used uh, was the attempt to reconstruct a personality. And um, I wondered where such a fiendish idea would have come from. And I found it um, in a 1951 science fiction novel uh, called um, The Demolished Man by Alfred Bester. And if you, if you are a science fiction buff, I certainly urge you to, to find that book and read it. Uh, basically, uh, the, the theory of the, no of the novel is that when somebody commits a crime, uh, that shows a certain boldness that society should appreciate, but in the wrong, it's in the wrong direction. And so what they do is they take criminals to the hospital, uh, and they regress them back to, uh, infantilism, and then they rebuild a new personality. Exactly the idea that, that Cameron was working on with his subjects. Uh, had been written about a few years before he began as a science fiction novel. I won't ever know whether he had read that novel uh, because Cameron is dead now, but the, the studies from his work showed that it did not work, and indeed it caused a great deal of, of pain uh, to a great number of people. Okay, uh, let's move on because uh, time is moving on. The, the um, idea of manipulating people with hypnosis in ways that are effective uh, and uh, in ways that are quite bizarre uh, it, it was born in the brain of George Estabrooks, seen here. Estabrooks, a um, very interesting character, uh, came up, was working in Morton Prince's laboratories at Harvard uh, in the 1920s, uh, and he had the idea that if you could create, if you could cure a multiple personality with hypnosis, maybe you could create one with hypnosis. Well, why in the world would anybody want to create a multiple personality? Well, Esther Brooks had the solution. You could create then a super spy or indeed a super assassin, somebody who would do the bidding uh, of the uh, his country, and have no knowledge that he was engaged in those in those acts. Uh, Esther Brooks um, said in 1928 um, that my views are here somewhat different from most psychologists. I believe the hypnotist's power to be unlimited, or rather to be limited only by his intelligence and his scruples. And so in the 1920s, he went around convincing, trying to convince the military to create hypnotically programmed individuals, create a multiple personality, and use that one as a uh, courier. They thought he was crazy and ignored him until the Moscow show trials. 
And then they took him seriously. And in the archives of his work at Colgate, there's a notation that he began, he stopped publishing in the mid 1930s because his work had then become classified. If you read his book, uh, oh, this is the, the Morton Prince's Dissociation of the Personality, um, the classic work, uh, beginning works on multiple personality. If you read Esther Brooks's book, Hypnotism, through its various editions, what you discover is that each edition is more assertive about the validity of creating hypnotically uh, programmed couriers. Uh, and finally, in an interview he gave, uh, in a local Rhode Island newspaper in 1963, he claims that this is not science fiction. It is fact. I have done it. Uh, working for the FBI and the CIA, that he created, he would create a multiple personality, program that personality to be a courier, send that personality somewhere in the world, and then have them return and have them be amnesic um, for all of that. Now, the idea may have originated with Esther Brooks, uh, and, uh, but he may not have been the first to actually publish it as such. Uh, writing in the Psychoanalytic Review of 1947, uh, Major Harry Levitt of the U.S. Army Medical Corps described the, the uh, hypnotic creation of a secondary personality. A quote, hypnotically induced automatic writing was established early in the course of treatment as a means of expeditiously gaining access to unconscious material. After this procedure was utilized for a time, a hypnotic secondary personality was produced by suggesting that the writing was under the control of a certain part of his personality unaware uh, to him. Uh, Levitt then said that he created another personality in direct contrast to the one already established so he could work the two um, created personalities off against one another. He concluded, uh, again, quote, Regardless of whether the production of multiple personalities by means of hypnosis could be construed as additional proof that hypnosis is an artificially induced hysteria, or whether the multiple personalities were artificial entities resulting from direct suggestions, there exists a close relationship to personalities spontaneously arising in hysterical dissociation. The importance of producing multiple personalities experimentally lies in the fact that certain elements of the original personality may be isolated, which manifest a minimum of censorship influences and thus may serve as helpful ad adjuncts in hypnoanalysis. Well, um, that was not the purpose for the intelligence agencies in working with the idea of creating uh, a, a multiple personality. Uh, the story of the intelligence agencies creating multiple personalities to use as couriers and assassins uh, may have begun with Esther Brooks, uh, and indeed uh, in CIA documents, I think this is, you can see Esther Brooks's theories worked out um, and, um, and discussed. Uh, but the, the genesis of the work begins in 1951 in the CIA Office of Security, uh, where a, a uh, an official named Morse Allen um, got the idea that CIA uh, agents should be trained in hypnosis, uh, and in order to train them in hypnosis, he arranged for them to go up to New York and um, get training from a stage hypnotist. As soon as he and the agents got to New York, the stage hypnotist spent an hour and a half with them, regaling them with tales of hypnotic seduction of how when the hypnotist went on the road, he would sleep with a different woman each night. Uh, some of them he would give hypnotic uh, uh, hallucinations that he was their husband. Uh, others he'd use other techniques. Uh, and, but that this was, this was um, a, a technique that he found very productive for his own sexual favors. The, the CIA, of course, was delighted to hear all of this um, and reported so in the documents. Uh, if you could use the technique to manipulate people that way, this is what they wanted to learn. And so that's how they got trained. Um, then in, in from two to 3,000 pages of documentation going from 1951 to 1954, um, the Morse Allen and his group replicated all of the known hypnosis experiments involving people putting their hands in, in acid or in jars of snakes and in shooting people, daggers, all of those experiments that the French and Germans uh, and, and American researchers uh, had conducted. 
uh, Esther Brooks um, uh, and Esther Brooks and others had conducted Morse Allen and his group replicated, um, but they wanted to go further and explore the possibility of using hypnosis to create uh, a, a programmed courier and a programmed assassin. The, the multiple personality idea itself may have come from Jekyll and Hyde, uh, which was very popular at the time. Um, another illustration of that idea in which two entirely different people can live within the same, uh, the same body, uh, one being the embodiment of good, the other the embodiment of evil. It was good fiction, but it also was part of the genesis from Morton Prince's work. Um, an Italian depiction of multiple personality. It's cut off at the top, but you can see the two faces uh, pointing in other directions. Uh, by the 1950s, the popular press was reporting uh, in the three phases of Eve uh, the existence of multiple personality. The three faces, of course, were more than three faces, and the final face was not the final face. Um, I'm Eve was uh, Chris Sizemore finally telling the story with her real name, um, and then telling it again, a mind of my own. Well, her mind may be her own, but her life isn't. She's now suing the um, film company, which claims uh, that did the, the movie The Three Faces of Eve. They claim they own the story of her life. She claims they own it only up to the time that she had three faces and that the other faces still belong to her. Um, so she's still not in control of her identity, uh, and the fight goes on. Uh, here she is um, in, in person. Sybil was then the next known, you know, or highly reported case of, of multiple personality disorder. Uh, Herb Spiegel tells me that Sybil was not a multiple, and that when he treated her in, in uh, Cornelia Wilbur's uh, absence, um, that Sybil never had any need to express uh, any other personalities with Herb. Uh, Herb admits she was brilliant and also extremely, uh, uh, I I I extremely mentally ill, but that she was not a multiple and that he refused to participate in the writing or publishing of the book if that was the, the spin they were going to take on her case. Uh, on the other hand, Herb doesn't believe, he believes that multiples exist, but that the condition is extraordinarily rare. And so people have argued that um, she was smart enough to know he wouldn't believe it, and therefore smart enough to conceal the personalities from him. So the debate goes on. The use of hypnosis um, to create multiple personalities and in general for intelligence purposes appears in a number of confidential secret documents, uh, just a few um, you know, of which I'll, I'll throw up on the screen. Um, some stories have leaked out how the CIA hid it, how they hid it, they didn't tell anybody about it, very simple. Um, the CIA explodes the old theory of hypnotic moral curb. Um, they came to the conclusion that people can be induced to do things that would violate their moral codes and that the folklore you can't get people to do things against their will was simply untrue. Um, and they carried those experiments further to study ways to create um, unwitting killers. Uh, CIA documents tell of a 1954 project to create involuntary assassins. This is the end product of Morse Allen's work. Uh, by 1954, he had exploded the moral curb theory. He had replicated all of the experiments on hypnotic coercion um, and had conducted other experiments on his own. But all of these were, in fact, laboratory-type experiments. Uh, he wanted to do more. He wanted to see whether operational use could be put to these principles. Uh, and so they, his group prepared a film called The Black Art. Uh, in, in the film, a, quote, oriental character, unquote, is having a drink with an American agent. A drug is surreptitiously placed in the drink that causes the oriental man to fall asleep. While dozing, he's hypnotized and programmed. Uh, the CIA had already experimented on hypnotizing people in sleep conditions and so forth. The next scene shows the Oriental man opening a safe containing secret files. He removes the files and then brings them to an American agent who reinforces the hypnotic suggestion. At this point, there's a voiceover by a narrator who asks, could what you have seen been accomplished without the individual's knowledge? Yes. Against the individual's will? Yes. With complete amnesia of performing the act? Yes. How? 
through the powers of suggestion and hypnosis. Um, again, by 1954, uh, Morse Allen was pushing hard um, to have operational tests of the thesis that you could construct a multiple personality and have that personality commit crimes, come back, uh, and have no knowledge in the host that that act had been committed. In other words, the Manchurian candidate scenario had been worked out by the CIA five years before the novel was published. Um, but would it work? Morse, in order to know whether it worked, you had to conduct what Morse Allen called terminal experiments. These were experiments that could result in the death of the subject. The CIA gave clearance for those experiments to be done, and in reference to one researcher who was asked if he would participate in them, he said, if you'd set up terminal experiments, I'll do them for free. Uh, the, by 1954, uh, the uh, literature demonstrates that Morse Allen's concerns uh, had, had uh, reached the higher levels of the CIA uh, and that they were willing to engage in uh, a, a field test for uh, the uh, Manchurian candidate type scenario. A January 1954 uh, artichoke memo says, quote, could an individual of a certain descent be made to perform an act of attempted assassination involuntarily under the influence of artichoke, unquote. And then later in the memo it says, as a trigger mechanism for an even bigger project, the CIA proposed, quote, that an individual of a certain descent, approximately 35 years old, well-educated, proficient in English, and well-established socially and politically in a foreign government, be induced under artichoke to perform an act involuntarily of attempted assassination against a prominent foreign politician or, if necessary, against an American official, unquote. Um, now, it was clear then by, by summer of 1954 that the artichoke team, team said we can create a, an artificial personality, program that personality to conduct an assassination. Uh, that assassination would occur if, in fact, the individual was captured. He would never reveal um, the knowledge that he had engaged in the assassination because the host would know nothing about the altar. Uh, the amnesia barrier would be impenetrable, and even under torture, the host would not reveal the secrets. Uh, CIA research in many universities around the country explored topics such as programming people by way of telephone, uh, whether somebody could be um, answer a telephone, a secret word would be given, they would slip automatically into a trance, nobody around them would know they were in trance, they wouldn't know they were in trance, and so forth. Experiments on pain, experiments Experiments on creating unconscious recorders. Experiments were done on whether people would commit suicide uh, under hypnotic instructions and so on. Albert Mole had written a hundred years ago that, that it would be possible to give people uh, hypnotic instructions to have them commit suicide. Uh, these were the subjects of CIA experiments. Um, what ultimately happened, we don't know because the government files closed up uh, at the point of reporting uh, on uh, the uh, assassination attempts, but a year later, a May 1955 type, top secret report called Hypnotism and Covert Operations begins with the following paragraph. Frankly, I now mistrust much of what is written by academic experts on hypnotism. Partly this is because many of them appear to have generalized from a very few cases and part, partly because much of their cautious pessimism is contradicted by agency experimenters, but more particularly because I have personally witnessed behavior responses which respected experts have said are impossible to obtain." Unquote. Uh, and so, um, by, the 19, by 1954, the Manchurian candidate scenario had already been thought of and was already under operational testing. This is Richard Condon, who wrote The Manchurian Candidate. Um, as Walter discovered when Walter uh, wrote him, uh, he had no idea that he was writing fact. He thought he was writing fiction. Um, and um, the only case that has come out of the literature that suggests someone who may have 
been an experimental subject is the, the control of Candy Jones. Um, Candy was uh, quite a beautiful woman, uh, second only to Betty Grable as a pinup girl during World War II. Um, but her artificial personality, um, Arlene Grant, I was programmed by the CIA, according to the book, to be a hypnotic courier, and she was sent around the world and occasionally captured and tortured. Her last instruction was to have a two-week vacation in Bermuda and then jump off a cliff. Uh, it did not happen because her husband, John Nebel, who was a very famous all-night disc jockey in New York, um, and an amateur hypnotist shortly after they were married began to feel that he had actually married two different women. Uh, and could not account for the mood swings and the differences in personality using hypnosis with her, um, this story unraveled. Uh, Candy was sent um, to Herb Spiegel for evaluation. Herb did a workup on her uh, using the hypnotic induction profile and other tests and found she was very, very high hypnotizable. And while he couldn't conclude that what she was saying was true, um, he could conclude that it would be true of her if it were true. In other words, she is the kind of person that this manipulation would have worked with. Uh, and so the, the Candy Jones story, uh, which we cannot validate and we cannot invalidate, I've seen a CIA file, Mark Grant, but I've not been able to get its contents. Um, it, it may be true, it may not be true. Uh, but the story about hypnotically programming couriers and assassins clearly is true. And that book was published before. Um, the CIA documents were made available. All of this, of course, violates the Nuremberg standards, um, but those standards uh, have had no application in uh, covert activities. Uh, we found a document from the Attorney General of the United States uh, to um, from the Justice Department, from the Attorney General of the United States to the Director of Central Intelligence, which said that if any of your agents are caught during their work they will not be prosecuted for crimes. And therefore, there is essentially the 007 license to kill uh, that CIA agents will not be prosecuted uh, for their crimes. Therefore, the Nuremberg standards do not apply. Um, it wasn't until the Nelson Rockefeller report to the president in June 1975 that we had any inklings uh, about this material. Uh, and then basically a paragraph or, or maybe even just a sentence mentioning mind and behavior control, uh, sent researchers looking for the files. Um, and um, in his testimony before Congress, Stansfield Turner corroborated the existence of the mind control programs. Um, some people wrote about them at the time. Peter Watson's book from England, The Military Uses and Abuses of Psychology, uh, touch on but do not give in any detail. Uh, the experiments done by the CIA and Army, but do talk in general about the use of psychology for military purposes. Um, the classic works, of course, are Walter's book, um, Operation Mind Control, which is uh, hard to find um, and a collector's item, uh, an extremely important book. Uh, John Marx's book, The Search for the Manchurian Candidate, uh, and my book, The Mind Manipulators. All three of them, uh, these were the only three books to appear on the subject of mind and behavior control uh, by the CIA and Army uh, experimental programs. Um, I want to move the story forward some more. Uh, from the CIA experiments in the 1950s uh, into the 1960s and beyond, the 1960s brought us a new variation, and that is the operational um, utilization of the techniques of brainwashing and sensory deprivation and so forth that had been explored in the 1940s and especially in the 1950s. And this is the religious cult issue. Um, this is um, Steve Hassan's book, uh, Combating Cult Mind Control. There's a, a revised edition available for sale probably the best of the deprogramming books uh, on, on mind control. Uh, but it was in the 1960s that the idea of using these techniques on essentially freestanding populations uh, was experimented with, and the cults provide the laboratory setting for social influence processes uh, where the people are not taken into a complete physical custody. Uh, and so it 
the cults themselves represent, I think, the step from the laboratory experiments into the real world operational use. Um, and then beyond them, you know, books like uh, Mind Bending on Cult Programming. Beyond them, we move into the books on Satanism uh, and on programming. Uh, this one, I think, is available for sale there. There are a couple more. Uh, this one may also be available for sale. Um, Satan's Children, linking the uh, multiple personality issue uh, with Satanism. Um, can we can we prove this? What where do we stand with our knowledge of Satanism? Well, speaking as a lawyer, it's going to be very rough going. To prove a widespread intergenerational network of satanic cults in court. Um, part of the reason for that is the report issued, um, oh, I'm sorry, that one's back with Pursuit of Satan, uh, by Ken Lanning, uh, who has concluded that though instances of satanic abuse do exist, there is no evidence to support um, intergenerational, widespread, multinational networks of satanic abuse. Uh, also, within the next two months, um, the most major study in the country uh, on this issue will reach the same conclusions as Ken Lanning. And that report is due in about two months. Uh, but the tentative conclusion, which will be the final conclusion, is that Lanning's perception is correct and that the evidence does not exist. Um, for intergenerational. Uh, now, the methodology can be challenged, uh, and in any event, the, the question of whether therapists who work with people who claim to be abused in satanic cults uh, should be sued is a separate issue from what can be proven. Is it reasonable for you to believe that widespread satanic abuse occurs? And the answer, I think, to that is yes. Despite the Lanning report and despite the conclusion that will come out later on, um, it is your job to believe your patients, at least within the therapy setting. And if they say it happened, then you work effectively with them by believing it happened. It's when there's a real-world corollary that the trouble begins. And so using my lawyer hat now, um, do not tell your patients to go out and sue their fathers or sue other people. Do not tell them to give newspaper accounts and so on. And to protect yourself in your clinical notes, um, say that this is the story your patient's told. You have no way of knowing whether it's true or not. And in any event, that's not your function. Your function is to make the person whole uh, with whatever material they present to you. Uh, as long as you do not advise that they go out and sue other people, you can advise them to seek um, legal help. If they say, you know, should I sue, should I sue, should I sue, you say, that's not my job. I'm not a lawyer. You should go to a lawyer and see what the lawyer says. I will support you in this session, whatever you decide to do. Uh, but what you decide to do in the outside world is a decision that must be made by you and, and other professionals, not, not, uh, not by me. Uh, as long as you do that, there should be no legal liability. If your patient sues you for believing all the crap that you're being told, in your notes somewhere should be, it's not my job to evaluate the historical validity of this information. Um, but I will work with it as if it's true, because for my client at this point in time, it is true. And that should protect you. All right, let's... let's um, Let's move on. Uh, again, um, we, there are isolated instances. There are also a, a large accumulation of information from local police departments uh, who are not as influential as the FBI. And the FBI did deny the existence of the mafia. Uh, and I, when I went to an FBI friend of mine who oversees the behavioral science uh, program there, I, I said, why does the FBI deny the existence of widespread Satanism and so on. And he looked at me and said they also denied the existence of the mafia. Uh, and so um, their conclusions 
um, can be rebutted in part by a lot of data from local police uh, that have found uh, ritualistic killings. The book Mortal Remains is an illustration of a case um, in Massachusetts where the bones were found where a satanic cult was practicing ritual murder. And so there are instances in which it can be proven. Uh, the existence of Satanism has, has, uh, is provable for over many centuries. And the existence of cults and mind control programming is provable beyond question. And so for therapists to believe that there are some cults that are satanic is true. To believe that those satanic cults, you know, may be more widespread than we think, than we have thought beforehand is reasonable. Uh, to believe that they engage in a bunch of horrendous practices. Look what the Nazi experimenters did and look what you and Cameron did. And how can you say there's a limit on human depravity? And so it's not unreasonable to believe that these kinds of things can occur. Um, and in any event, um, when you work with trauma, you work more effectively by believing uh, the story that it has come from. Okay. Um, let's go further. Uh, the, in breaking uh, bodies and minds, the role of um, psychiatric abuse and mental health professionals uh, in creating torture victims uh, and mind control victims is discussed. The complicity between um, torturers and professionals who help in the torture uh, has been documented. Uh, this is the uh, Irving Janus report in 1949 that validated the use of hypnosis as part of the conditioning techniques uh, being used by the Soviets. A RAND report in 1958 uh, again reaches the same conclusions, the involvement of hypnosis in brainwashing and other forms of programming. Um, the book Why Men Confess is one of the, written by a former assistant attorney general of the United States, traces modern mind control back to the Malleus Maleficarum uh, through the Moscow show trials and other places. Uh, it's a good legitimate source for understanding uh, the modern false memory stuff, which I'll get to right now. There has been only one completely litigated case involving false memory. Can you implant false memories? Of course. We knew that a hundred years ago. Uh, and we've come a long way since then, as you can see uh, in, in this talk. This is uh, Eileen Franklin and her daughter. Uh, her case is the only criminal case uh, which has gone to trial uh, in which repressed memory played a major role. Uh, she claimed that her father uh, killed her friend um, Susan Nason, who's up on the top. Look, at, And that's her daughter uh, on the bottom. Look how much... Uh, alike they are. Uh, the story that Eileen Franklin tells is that she was looking into her daughter's eyes one day and suddenly the image of watching her father kill her friend Susan when Susan was eight years old, uh, 20 years earlier, came into her mind uh, and then the memory started to flood back of that experience. Uh, this is her father when he was arrested. Take a good look at him. Here he is at trial on the right. You, you, learn, you learn a lesson about lawyering. That's his lawyer on the left. Um, you clean up the client. Um, you don't bring him into court looking like that. No, nope, he looks like that on the right. Now, yeah, you can you can introduce the pictures, but it's not as powerful as the the the, the present uh, appearance. Now, the, the Franklin the Franklin case is a very troubling one. And we have to be honest about that because uh, we, we are first and foremost scientists. Uh, and, and unlike the false memory, uh, we do not need to have a political agenda here. Uh, Eileen Franklin is a liar. She told four different stories about the genesis of her memory, one of which was that she was hypnotized in therapy. If that story were true, she would have been disqualified as a witness in California courts. When she learned that, or we, we hypothesized that when she learned that, she went back to her brother and she said, you know, I told you I've been hypnotized. Forget I said that. That's tampering with evidence. And so she told actually four different stories about um, how she recovered her memory, and that's grounds to disbelieve her because there is clear evidence of lying uh, in the way in which she presented herself. 
On the other hand, the fact that she's a liar does not mean that the story she told is false. The false memory people make that assumption, and that's bad logic. They may be right that she's a liar and her story is is false, but you cannot make that jump as a logical matter. On the other hand, her father um, uh, is my first knowledge of the case, uh, real knowledge, came from a cab ride with Beth Loftus on my left and David Spiegel on my right in Chicago when Beth and I were both plenary speakers at the ISSMPD meeting in Chicago a few years back. And both of them had just come from testifying in the case. Uh, both of them testified against uh, Eileen Franklin. Uh, and uh, each of them in the cab in my presence concluded that if, if her story were true and that it might be true, it would have been true of this man. This man abused um, his physically abused his son and sexually molested his daughters. He had a violent past. It's well documented. When he was arrested, he had a large collection of child pornography. He had an active correspondence with women to have sexual relations with their seven and eight year old daughters. He had pictures of those activities involving him. Um, her, her memories may be true or may not be true. He is the kind of person they would be true of. There was independent physical corroboration, in other words, of his pedophilia, uh, of his violence, and of, the, of the, the fact that this is the kind of man who would have committed that sadistic uh, molesting and murder. Uh, it's up to the jury then to decide whether that evidence is enough. But her repressed memory was not the only basis of the testimony. The defense argued that everything that she remembered was available in a newspaper somewhere. She had no independent memories apart from anything that was in a newspaper. And that point was, was made to the jury. The jury convicted, um, and um, Franklin, is uh, the father, is now uh, in jail for, for life. The California courts have rejected his appeal, and his lawyers have filed a motion in federal district court. They have imported Richard Offshe, a specialist in social influence, to work over the mother who testified against him at trial, and she has now changed her mind. Um, of course, th this is not an unusual phenomenon. Now that he's in jail and she could have recriminations, she might have changed her mind anyway, but the introduction of a social influence specialist with a political agenda um, to spend a lot of time with her to reach a certain conclusion, it seems to me is a point if there is a new trial that will be raised at that new trial. Um, what I found very interesting is I, ta I interviewed the lawyer, his lawyer, the prosecutor, um, and his appellate lawyers. And in their brief on appeal, the appellate lawyers wrote that no responsible person would believe that the concept of robust repression is false. In other words, the, the Offshee-Singer hypothesis that, that you cannot forget traumatic events over a sustained period of time and that it's the, quote, scientific quackery of the 20th century, unquote, is, in the opinion of these lawyers, irresponsible thinking. And I agree. The evidence shows that the Offshe Singer hypothesis is wrong. The evidence comes from biological um, studies of memory and how the brain processes traumatic memories differently than normal memories. And that also explains why Loftus's research um, on normal memory is irrelevant to the issue of traumatic memory, a point that she is now reluctantly starting to recognize. Is um, I Eileen Franklin at trial? Is Freud dead? Um, if you knock out the notion of robust repression, uh, as the false memory people have been trying to do, you have a very simplistic idea. If, if a person can be repeatedly traumatized as a child, have no adult recollection of that trauma, go into therapy and then have a recollection, then the therapist must have implanted it if robust repression is not real. And so the existence of robust repression as the underpinning of the scientific foundation for the false memory argument is quite crucial. But that argument is now shown to be scientifically invalid, which doesn't mean that the false memory position is wrong. They are right about what 
therapists have been doing and shouldn't be doing, uh, the misuse of social influence procedures, but they're wrong about the issue of robust repression. That means that somebody can go to a therapist and, and have that memory refreshed, and that memory can be true which makes it a harder case. The world is no longer black and white. Um, you cannot use the iatrogenic cause argument in every case of, of robust repression. Uh, the, father fits, uh, the father Porter cases are an illustration of robust repression, memories that were recovered without hypnotic intervention and in the absence of a therapeutic encounter. Uh, you, you may know the Father Porter story. My time is short, so I, I can't go through it uh, with you now. But in any event, he recovered the memories of having uh, been molested. He was able to validate those memories as to himself. And Father Porter is now in jail having confessed to having molested uh, between 50 and 100 young boys and girls. And so in, in the search for the, the um, unraveling of the human mind, uh, mind control is real. It has a rich history. Uh, I've only given you a, a fraction of the history. We haven't touched, as I said, on the physiological or pharmacological aspects. We haven't talked about behavior modification and conditioning techniques and so forth. Uh, we've just concentrated on the, the principles that are closest to the work that, that you'll be doing. We haven't talked about social influence theories in general, uh, but the existence of mind control, its work in secret laboratories, its work in CIA and Army experiments, its spilling over into religious cult settings, and its use in freestanding populations are all validated. Uh, and that ought to give hypnosis the kind, or rather give mind control the kind of respectability it deserves and give you the background to believe the kinds of stories that your patients are telling you as at least possible. Thank you. We've been listening to a lecture by Dr. Alan Shefflin entitled The History of Mind Control, What We Can Prove and What We Can't. You've been listening to CKLN 88.1 in this series on mind control. Next week we're going to be having uh, featuring an interview with Claudia Mullen, Valerie Wolf, and Chris Ebner the day that they had given the mind control testimony to the Presidential Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments in 1995. Uh, if you uh, uh, have missed any of the shows, uh, just stay tuned for this message and find out uh, how you can remedy that. CKLN is rebroadcasting a groundbreaking radio series, Mind Control in Canada, currently airing on the Sunday morning show, The International Connection. Starting June 2nd on Alternative Radio, Monday nights from 10 to 11 p.m., the eight-month radio series Mind Control in Canada will be aired. This series looks into the U.S. and Canadian government's history of mind control experimentation, and particularly the experiments done to children in creating programmed multiple personalities by means of severe trauma and abuse. If allegations of the survivors are true, and what government documentation would point to, the leaders, intelligence agencies, and militaries of North America have been using mind control for political, military, and criminal purposes for decades. To hear interviews and lectures with survivors, researchers, and therapists on this important topic, tune in to CKLN 88.1 FM Monday evenings from 10 to 11 p.m. for the rebroadcasts or Sunday mornings 9.30 to 10.30 a.m. for the breaking story on mind control. 